Today we're going to talk about peace and how as fully devoted followers of Christ, we should pursue peace. Sadly, we live in a world that lacks peace. I mean, everywhere we turn today, we just hear more and more sadness, more and more conflict, more and more argument. It's on the news, it's on Facebook. We see it in school, we see it at work. Everywhere we look, we just see this lack of peace. Now, as Christians, this doesn't really surprise us, right? We know that there's been a lack of peace in this world since Genesis 3, when man decided to sin against God and to bring sin and death and destruction into this world. And ever since then, we've just been following in this pattern of just anger and hostility and disconnect. I mean, as you read through the Bible, you you just see this. I mean, we have Cain who kills Abel. We have uh, Jacob and Esau you know, cheating each other. We have Joseph and his brothers, you know, disagreeing and even selling him into slavery. And we have Moses and Pharaoh duking it out. And that only really gets us just past the first book of the Bible. And this constant conflict, this this, this lack of peace, it's, it's not healthy. Now, if we're involved in it or if we're just in proximity to it, just tends to wear us down. It gets in our minds, and it just causes us physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health problems. Leaves us anxious, tired, confused, and often hopeless. And we know that this conflict uh, rises from our sinful nature. And so since we as Christians have been set free from this this sinful nature, we should be the ones pursuing and spreading this peace everywhere we go. And in today's text, Philippians 4, 2 through 9, Paul will show us just how we can pursue this peace and promote peace. Remember, Paul's writing this letter uh, to his dear friends, and they find themselves in lots of conflict, hoping for peace. There is conflict and hardship both outside of the church as well as inside the church. This church is located in the Roman Empire, which had this promise of peace. Pax Romana was was the saying of the day. Pax Romana is this Roman peace. It's this state of peace and prosperity that took place at the height of the Roman Empire. There was all these laws and this way of living and doing life and and just this strong support system throughout the kingdom with with roads and everything that just helped to to just bring peace and to, to bring prosperity. And so it really was a good time to be alive. But the church here, they were not... They were not sensing this peace, right? I mean, the Romans, they had come in and they had overtaken all these other nationalities and they allowed them to blend together, right, under this Pax Romana. But Christians were not. Because they chose to worship God and Jesus Christ and not the emperor. And this created a lot of problems. But I'm sure with all this this talk of peace going around, it even left the church more in despair, right? We're supposed to be in this Pax Romana, and yet this just isn't true to our current situation. And so that's why Paul is offering them a different kind of peace, a true peace, a better peace that comes only from Jesus. I already mentioned this the city was actually one of the, the main sites for the emperor worship because a lot of ex military guys retired in the city of Philippi. And so there was just all this loyalty to this emperor. And because this emperor had conquered all these things and brought in peace through fighting, through conquering, he was worshiped. 
But since the, since the true Christians refused that, they were just really persecuted and not allowed. And, and in the next few years after this letter is written, we're going to see that um, even hype up. And we know many of the famous stories of Christians being fed to lions and all that stuff. And we're, we're just slightly before that. So please stand with me as we read today's text, Philippians 4, 2 through 9. If you need a copy of God's Word, there's some back at the hospitality table, and you can take that with you uh, when you leave today. It'll also be up on the screen. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Fully devoted followers of Christ should be pursuers and promoters of peace. If you've been following along with us through this book, no doubt you have noticed that there are some themes that Paul is constantly repeating throughout. We have joy, unity, truth, gospel living, just to name a few. And the two biggest are unity and joy. In our text today, Paul is going to continue on this theme of unity through the lens of peace. He is also moving more from just these general teachings about unity, and he's focusing into the specific needs of this church, telling them specifically how they can promote peace and unity among themselves. He's also getting very personal in this text, calling people out by name, something that he seldom does, in his epistles. But even though it, it, it's very personal, there are still things that we can learn about today as we talk about pursuing peace and also the path that we can take to peace. The pursuit of peace is found in verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 calls us to focus on our unity in Christ and to not sweat the small stuff. Because Paul's calling these two women out by name, and he's urging them equally, right? He says, I entreat, uh, that word entreat, that word is urge, right? I urge both of these women. He doesn't say, I urge this one and not this one. He urges both of them to agree in the Lord. Now, we don't know what the issue that was going on. We don't know what they were, they were fighting about, because Paul didn't see him to find it necessary. And so from this, we can conclude that their argument really wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't over doctrine or, or something major in regards to the gospel, because as we've seen earlier in this book, Paul has no problem calling out false doctrine, calling out false teaching. But he did find this problem big enough to call out. And since we don't have the details and we're assuming that this is probably something small like the color of the carpet or whether to have drinks in the sanctuary, we can see that this call for peace, this, this loving one another well, 
is far more important than these insignificant matters. It's far more important than our personal preferences. Now, it seems most likely that perhaps a church split was coming along here. Paul calls these ladies uh, fellow workers, right? They've labored uh, alongside of him. These ladies were probably very instrumental in the planting of this church, and so they were probably very respected and probably served in leadership in some, uh, some manner here. And because of that, and because they were feuding, they were probably leading separate feuds. This side wanted blue, this side wanted green carpet, or something like that. And because Paul doesn't want their witness to be ruined to the world around them, and because he understands there's so much more to be lost, he understands that so many people's faith would be hurt over this insignificant little fight that he's nipping it in the butt. And he's calling these ladies out. Paul is urging these two ladies in the church to agree in the Lord. The, the, this, this, the Greek here brings us back to Philippians 2, verses 2 through 5, where we are called to have the same mind as Christ. Right? We are called to think alike. We are called to be like Christ. Now this doesn't mean that the ladies must agree on whatever their disagreement is, but that they should have the same mind as Christ. There should be humility, love, gentleness, care for one another. They need to look out for the interest of others and not just seek what they want, what's the best for them. They're to seek other people's good, and not their own preferences. And so acting like Christians towards each other is far more important than whatever these two are squabbling about. Agreeing in the Lord also means that we can focus on the major things, like the gospel, right? And we don't have to fuss about the other things. You see, when we have the gospel in common, we can be united around that. We can be together for the gospel because nothing is more important than that. This is why we can meet together as a multi-ethnic church. Because we, we may disagree on social issues like police brutality and racism. And we may disagree on the best methods to fix all of the social ills. But because we love and we worship the same God in heaven, we can come together here on Sunday and we can worship him together. We can be in community with one another, helping each other grow in our sanctification, having the same mind about who Christ is. And this allows us to put on this united front to show the world that it's not about us. It's not about what I want, but about what God wants. It's about God's kingdom. <clears throat> this is also why we sing such a variety of songs here at the bridge. We as leaders, we try to think of other people and what they need to worship God. And so we sing gospel, we sing hymns, we sing contemporary worship songs. We don't allow one person's opinion or preference to rule. And trust us, we've gotten plenty of opinions and preferences on this topic. But we don't allow just that one person to have their way. And us elders, we can be united on this because we agree on the big things about music. We agree that this music should be focused on God and not ourselves. We believe that this music should be theo theologically sound. We agree that it should be singable, it should be relevant, and it should be sung for the purpose of worship and teaching. And because we agree on these big major points, we don't care what the sound sounds like. We don't need to argue about, well, I like hymns and I like gospel. 
This is also the reason why our statement of faith as a church deals only with those things that are essential to the gospel and being a Christian. We focus on things like Jesus Christ as being the only means of salvation, the only way to heaven. We, we hold hard to the inerrancy and authority of the Bible. We stick to the fact that there is only one God in heaven who is the creator of all things. But we don't require people to believe in a literal six day or seven days of creation. We don't require that everyone agree on the method of baptism or women preachers. We allow differences on these non-essential items because what we agree on is so much more important, so much bigger than these other things. And we're able to extend grace to one another. We're able to seek understanding and allow the Spirit to lead us to a common agreement on all these other things. Because, simply, we believe that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, we've been very fortunate as a church. We do not have a lot of persecution from the outside, and we have not had any major disagreements internally. Praise the Lord for that. But we must continue on in, in having this mind of where we are focusing on Christ, we are focusing on the big things, we are focusing on peace with one another. Because I know the devil. I know his tricks. I know that he will come in and he will seek to divide us, to spread us apart, to bring hurt, to bring pain, to bring a lack of peace. And so as people of this church, we must continue to have the mind of Christ. We must continue to think of others better than ourselves. We must continue to show humility and grace to one another. Now the second thing that we see from these verses in pursuing peace is that we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, should help others seek this peace. Verse 3 calls for the true companion to help these women agree in the Lord. Once again, we're not told exactly who this true companion is. It's singular in the Greek here. So he may be referring to one person, maybe the elder of the church, or Timothy, or Paul, uh, not Paul, Timothy, or one of these other disciples, Luke, was very influential in this church. Or it could be that he's taken the whole church and he's lumped them together in one and he's putting this responsibility on everybody in the church to help these two sisters get along in the Lord. And this is what I tend to think, that he's referring to the whole church. But really, it doesn't really matter whether he's calling out one person or he's calling out the entire church the lesson is still the same for us. As Christians, we should help to bring peace when there's disagreement between our brothers and sisters. We should encourage them. We should admonish them. Maybe we'll have to mediate between people. But this is the church's responsibility. This is not just us as elders. So if you notice that there is a disagreement going on between two brothers and sisters, and obviously it's gotten big enough to, um, to notice, then you guys should seek to bring peace to that. Our, our sinful nature tells us to run away from this, right? To not get involved. Well, that's just their issue. But if, if we don't handle that issue, that issue expands. It's kind of like cancer, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing and taking over. Because when people are not at peace at each other, they, they carry that anger with them. They carry that hostility. They carry that frustration that they have this per, with this person over here, and they carry it everywhere they go. They're going to be bad-mouthing that person or trying to get other people on their side. Right, so that they have the majority when it comes time to vote. <clears throat> and this cancer, this cancer destroys a church. 
And so if we are mature in Christ, we should be ones to call this out, to cut this cancer out, to bring peace. Call our brothers out and be like, man, you're not acting Christ-like right now. You're going and spreading all this gossip about this person. Hey, are you showing grace to that person right now? Are you seeking to understand their viewpoint? Or are you just trying to get your way? Are you trying to just prove your point without hearing the true problem that they're trying to address? Now, I'm not saying you should go around looking for trouble. I don't mean that you should be sticking your nose in everybody's business. But we are called to care for one another. We are called to hold each other accountable as brothers and sisters of Christ. We are our brother's keeper. And so we should keep this goal of unity, this goal of peace, and seek that. Not seek our own good. Not seek the hero status. Well, look, I helped those two solve one age-old problem that they were arguing over. I helped them to decide on pink carpet instead of blue or green, right? We, we can't have that attitude. We must have this same mind as Christ of humility, of humbleness, and peace. And so now we're going to move on to some different things that we can do in our own lives to promote this peace. As we move on to verse 4, we see Paul moving from this appeal to pursue peace to the path of peace. And these are practical steps to, to cultivate peace, both in ourselves, but hopefully that boils up and out of us and spreads out to the community. And when I say community, I mean this church, your family, your neighborhood, your workplace, all of those communities. As, as disciples of Christ, our peace that we have from God should be flowing out, bringing peace to all this hostility that we see in this world. And there are five things that Paul is gonna, that we're going to talk about here. This is not an exhaustive list, and it's not a list to be meant to go in order. The in fact, all of these things we really should be practicing simultaneously if we truly want to foster peace in ourselves and in others. The first step is to have joy. This is why we sung Rejoice in the Lord earlier today. This is the other major theme of this book. And we can trace it all the way from the beginning to the end of this book. The Greek word that is translated as joy or rejoice, depending on its context, is found 14 times in this little book. So this is a big deal for Paul. Joy is a positive human condition that can be either feeling or action. Joy is a feeling that is called forth by well-being, by success by good fortune. A person automatically experiences this because of a certain favorable circumstance. It cannot be commanded. It cannot be forced. It's just this natural thing that just pours out of us when good stuff happens. But joy can also be an action. And this form of joy can be engaged in regardless of circumstances or how we feel. We see in the Bible several places where Scripture talks about this type of joy. All the way back in Proverbs, Proverbs 5.18 tells the reader to rejoice in the wife of his youth. This is a command to rejoice in her. It doesn't say that she's going to be the prettiest thing. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have fights. The command is to rejoice. And so it's not based on any conditions. It's just simply rejoice. Christ instructed his uh, disciples to rejoice when they were persecuted, reviled, and slandered in Matthew 5. The command to continuously rejoice is found in 1 Thessalonians 5.16. And James said in his epistle that Christians should reckon it, that they should consider it all joy when they fall into various testing because such testings produce endurance. I don't know about you, but none of what I just read there 
sounds like a situation that I'm just naturally going to have joy. None of, hardships, temptations, trials, none of that sounds like it's going to bring joy to me. And so therefore we must force ourselves, we must put our joy into action. But how? How do we do this? How do we summon joy when everything around us just wants to, to suck it out of us and steal that joy? I mean, even look at the Apostle Paul in his current situation, right? He's in prison, he's all this, and yet he has found a way to rejoice. And I think the reason that he can rejoice is because he knows who Christ is. And he knows that our joy comes from our salvation. <clears throat> we can Paul. Follow Paul's command here by remembering the hope and the joy that it comes from our salvation. The Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary says, The experience of deliverance and anticipation of salvation are the most significant occasions for rejoicing among people, or among the people of God in the Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament, the coming of the Messiah who delivers his people and brings salvation becomes the basis for rejoicing. And this is perhaps why Paul is reminding his readers in the next verse that the Lord is near. And so if we want to have this inner peace, if we want to be able to rejoice, then we need to recall back to that sweet, sweet day when God took hold of us and made us his sons and daughters. I want you guys to think back to that day when the gospel first made sense to you. I want you to think about all the emotions that welled up when you found out that you were lovable, when you found out that you were forgiven, when you found out that you were no longer facing a death sentence, but yet you had eternal life given to you. Think back to how just relieved you felt that it was no longer dependent upon you and your actions, but yet God made a way through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sins. Think back. Think back to any time that God has stepped in and worked in your life and brought in you joy. Maybe this was healing from a disease. Maybe this was delivering from a sin or an addiction. Perhaps it was God's protection in an accident or hard times. Perhaps it was God giving you endurance to go through those hard times. Whatever it is, think about that. Think about the feelings that you have. And I know that when I think about this, when I think about the gospel and this wonderful gift of salvation that I have, I have no choice but to rejoice. It fills me with such happiness that I am free from sin, that I am accepted and loved. All my shame, all my fear, Christ took that on the cross. And I am now his son. And if we can draw on these, I think it leads us to worship. And this is worship through remembrance, right? Because we're reminding ourselves of everything that God has done. And so for Paul, this is what he's calling on these people to do. Remember your salvation. Remember that you have Christ. Remember. Remember. But how often do we remember? How often do we think back to that day and we think about the story? We think about the most important thing that has ever happened to us. We have anniversaries to celebrate weddings. We have birthdays to celebrate being born. But what do we do to remember that day? 
And it's not a specific day for everyone. Mine's not a specific day, but it's a process. And I can remember events along the way where just more and more of the gospel just became very clear to me. But what are we doing to remember those things? And how often are we telling other people our story? How often are we telling people of the wonderful joy and the peace that we have from knowing Jesus Christ? Because I'm willing to bet that if we would just think about our story, and if we would tell other people our story, there would be a lot more joy in our lives as we focus on just the positiveness of being a Christian. So there's two practical things that I want you guys to do this week to help you foster joy. One is write out your story. Write down all the times that God has stepped into your life and worked. These can be big, crazy, huge things like salvation. And these can just be little insignificant seeming things like a job, a home, right? God had all his hand in that. God, God worked all of that stuff out for you. So write that down. And if you're having troubles with that, talk to the youth group. We've been working on our stories for the last month. of just, And so they know what they're doing. They can tell you the three parts of your story and all that jazz, all right? And the second thing is to tell people your story. Tell your kids. Tell your bridge group. Tell your coworkers, your neighbors. Tell anybody that will listen to you about your story of how God rescued you and the joy that he brought to you. Rejoice. I'll say it again. Rejoice in the Lord. The second thing we can do to, to foster peace, well, it really makes about as much sense as the first to our sinful nature, right? Because in persecution, when we want this peace, we don't think about joy we think about the bad stuff. And the second point is graciousness. We're told to let our graciousness be known to those who are persecuting us. The ESV translates this word as reasonableness. Uh, others graciousness and others gentleness. But I feel graciousness really best describes this attitude that, and actions that we should have towards one another. And so the, this concept of, of being gracious to others means that in spend, instead of responding harshly to them, instead of fighting fire with fire, we respond with love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. You know, the way Jesus would respond to these situations. Proverbs commands this all, or the Bible commands this all through Scripture starting in Proverbs 15.1, uh, says a gentle answer turns away anger, but a harsh word stirs up wrath. And then Jesus did a lot of teaching on this topic of, of graciousness, right? He told his disciples to turn the other cheek, and he told his disciples to forgive 70 times 7. In Matthew 8.21-22, through 22, we read this story, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times seven. See, the law required you to forgive people three times, and after that, you're on your own. And so Peter's coming to him, he's like, all right, Jesus, I'm going to forgive like twice and then some of the law, right? So I'm good, right? Seven times. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Seventy times seven. And so this was just a, a, a manner of speaking to convey this point that forgiveness has no end. That no matter how many times we are for offended, we should forgive other people. Jesus wants to reinforce this idea of forgiveness and so he tells this parable immediately following these statements. It's the parable of the unforgiven servant. You all know, right? There's this uh, 
A guy calls one of his servants in, and he has this massive debt. But the servant begs for forgiveness, and he says, all right, I will forgive you your debt. You're free to go. I'm not going to throw you in prison. But then that servant goes out, and he's got all these other middle, little piddly debts from other people, and he just, he's just ungracious. And he demands that they pay their small little debt, right? And in doing so, Jesus is showing this importance of, faith, of, of grace and peace and love and gentleness and graciousness towards other people. Remember, we talked about earlier this Pax Romana being the way of the day, right? And the Pax Romana, they sought peace through strength, peace through conquering. This, this was how they brought peace to the Roman Empire, is just by taking over. It's like, oh, you got a problem with us? All right, we're just going to beat you into submission and bring you in as part of Rome. And that's how they brought peace. But this is not the way of Christ. Because God calls his people to seek peace through surrender. Peace through gentleness, grace, and forgiveness. Showing us that God's kingdom is, once again, way different than the world. But how do we do this? How do we forgive those who are persecuting us? How do we forgive those who are just difficult to get along with? How do we forgive those and show our graciousness to those who have done us wrong? Well, obviously this is a work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reminds us just how much God has forgiven us. If we look back to this parable that I just talked about, right? And we put God as the ultimate thing. And he forgave other people. And his expectation in forgiving this servant is that he will go out and forgive his other fellow servants. And we are told in Ephesians 4.32 and Colossians 3.13 to forgive other people because Christ has forgiven us. And I guarantee you that God has forgiven you far more than anyone else has offended you. And so we can think back and we can recall this forgiveness that's brought us joy, and therefore we can be gracious to other people. Because our debt was canceled, we can cancel their debt. Because we were forgiven, we can forgive others. So who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to show graciousness towards? Who offended you this last week? Who cut you off when you were on the highway? Who failed to show up to work? Did you show them grace? Or did you show them wrath? Who in your life are you holding a grudge against because they have done something wrong? It could be your spouse, your siblings, your kids, coworkers. Your neighbor. If you're still getting hot and bothered when you think about that person or you think about a situation that you have with that person, chances are you're not living in graciousness. That you've not forgiven that person. Like I already talked about, when we, we don't forgive that person, when we have all that anger, we just carry that with us wherever we go. And we, we put up this wall against this one person because we're beefing with them. But that wall just goes with us wherever we go. And so whoever we're, we're talking to, we still have that wall. We still have that anger. We still have that hostility. And the only way to tear down that wall is forgiveness. Forgiveness like Christ. So is there someone you need to go apologize to? To let them know that you didn't handle this right? Or is there someone that you need to go talk to and just say, hey man, that really hurt me when you did this. But I'm forgiving you. It's all right, we're good. Because when we forgive, that, that's how peace takes place. Without forgiveness, there can be no place. And you know what else is pretty awesome about this? If we're willing to, to be humble, if we're willing to go and let our graciousness show to other people, 
chances are it's going to lead to opportunities to share how God has forgiven us of all of our sins. It's just a natural transition into the gospel. Hey, man, I'm forgiving you. You want to know why I can forgive you? Because Christ forgave me. Very easy way to do that. Now the next verse we're going to talk about, hello, is verses 6 and 7. And these are probably the best known verses in the entire book, as well as one of the better uh, known in the entire Bible. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 um, says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, I preached an entire sermon on these verses back in our prayer series, and so I'm not going to go super in-depth here for the uh, sake of time. But if, if, if what I'm saying doesn't make sense or doesn't scratch your itch, feel free to, to look that up uh, on our website or through the church app and, and just review those sermons um, on this topic. So as we already talked about, the natural reaction of men when it comes to hard time is to worry, to be anxious, to fret, right? We try and figure out how a way that we can avoid this discomfort or how we can just fix this discomfort so we don't have to deal with it anymore. But Paul is saying here that we are to trust God to fix this situation. And we prove our trust to God by making our requests known to him through prayer. That this really should be our default as Christians. Before anything else, we should simply just pray and seek God. And this doesn't mean that we just pray and expect God to make everything better, right? Because we often have to seek God for wisdom on how to handle it. Or perhaps we need to ask God to change our hearts so that we can forgive somebody and bring about peace. And we can see God simply just asking for the strength to endure this hardship. <clears throat> and sometimes we may even have to ask God to show us our sin and so that we can see what we are doing to add to this conflict. Because every situation, every hard time that we face is going to be different. But the good news is we have the same loving God, the same compassionate God, the same mighty God who will be there in every situation. And so our, our part in this is simply to pray. God's part is to bring the peace. And this peace of God is really our promise that we have when we pray. The, the, the language here, to guard our hearts, it's, it's military terms, right? And so when we pray, when we're asking God to help us in these situations, we can expect that God will be there with us, standing on guard, making sure that the enemy cannot get in. And we can be confident that God will do this because God is good, because God loves us, because God does have the power to make peace in any situation. And Romans 8 tells us that God is working all these things out for our good. Now, we may not understand how it is for our good. We may not like the results of it. But we can trust that God knows what he is doing. And we can be confident that he has everything under control. And so we can peacefully lay our heads down at night knowing this, knowing that we have taken it to God, that he is working through this, that he will be there right in the thick of it with us to see this through. Let's so leave the heavy lifting up to God and just be faithful to take everything into him as prayer. Just like that song said, right? What a friend we have in Jesus. So we should take everything to him in prayer. All of our trouble, all of our heartache, all of our difficulties, all everything.
in prayer. Well, now we're going to shift gears slightly here, and we're going to turn our attention to the truth that we find in verse 8. Paul is letting the Philippians know that peace comes from focusing on the truth. Now, it's easy to over-spiritualize this verse and go straight to Jesus' statement that I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? I mean, that'll preach, right? Because we should be focusing on that truth. But if we're going to be proper Bible scholars here, if we're going to understand and handle this, word, this, this text correctly, well, then we've got to look at the, the most common word in this verse, which is um, whatever, Set before every one of these categories, whatever, whatever, whatever. And Paul is saying that whatever in any of these categories is good, Christians should think about. This whatever opens us up to accept good things, God's good things, from wherever they come from. This could be science, medicine, society, secular books, and movie. And we still need to process this all through the lens of Scripture and make sure that this is not contradictory to anything in Scripture. But remember, all truth, all goodness, all justice, all purity, all love is ultimately from God. And so we should accept it. And when we do this, I think this really affects our witness, right? Right? When we affirm God's truth that is found outside of the Bible, we show the world that we are not combative, that we are not just old prudes, that we're not separatists. And in fact, we can even reclaim those truths in the name of God by pointing people to the Creator who created all of these truths. For example, I can hold it true and think about the fact that all matter is made up of tiny little things called atoms. Right? And it's good for me to think about atoms and to, to, to just ponder how complex this is, how perfectly it works, right? Because that just leads me to awe. That leads me to worship. Like, man, there is a God up in heaven who is so cool that he like made all this cool little neurons and protons and all this stuff, right? And science tells us this. You don't see this teaching in the Scripture. But yet it doesn't go against anything in Scripture either. However, I must reject the Big Bang Theory because the Bible clearly says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So remember, the Bible, it wasn't written to us as a scientific textbook. God didn't give us the Bible so that we could cure cancer and all the other diseases. God gave us the Bible so that we could know him, so that we could know who he created us to be, and we could know how to have a relationship with him. And so all the other things that we have discovered through science, through medicine, research, sitting under an apple tree, are God's truth. And he originally created them. And when we discover them, this is actually just part of us fulfilling the work that God has called us to do in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took man and he placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And so if you're going to plant a garden... There's a lot of work that goes into it, and it's more than just the physical labor of breaking up the dirt and putting the, gra or putting the seeds in there. You have to know some science. You have to know what type of nutrients the soil needs to help this plant grow. You need to know how much water, how much sun is required, right? Photosynthesis, if you remember all the way back to elementary school. You have to know how to stop insects and animals from attacking the plant. If the plant gets a fungus or a disease, you need to know how to, to cure that. Right? And all this is simply to say that we should not be opposed to God's truth that we discover as part of us living out this command to do the work 
that God put us here on earth to do. Remember whose image you bear. All, all the creativity, all of the knowledge and the truth that God has, he put that into us, right? That's what it means that we are created in his image. We have the characteristics of him. We have some of the, the skills of him on a much smaller scale. And so figuring all this stuff out is just part of that. And so Paul, he, he's listing this list here to draw us back to that, to help us remember that all truth is God's truth and that we can build commonality with people through focusing on this truth. I also think that this helps us to, um, to fight against the, the temptation to just, just label everything in the world as evil and to want to just, just stay away from it, right? Where we're very quickly to to say technology is evil or rock music is evil or all these other things, right? But if we, if we use Paul's test here, if we think about things, if they are good, if they are noble, if they are honorable, then these are things of Christ and these are things that we should focus on. Remember, God's definition of peace is not simply the lack of conflict, but rather a state of being where things are as they should be. Things are as God created them to be. And so God created all this pureness, all this truth, all these excellent things in our world. And so we can focus on those to help us have joy. And the last thing we're going to talk about today is following the right example. In verse 9, Paul urges his audience to follow everything he has taught them and his example. He is reminding them, obviously, of the gospel, but he's reminding them of everything that he taught them, every sermon, every Sunday school lesson they sat through. He's reminding them of this. He's calling them to be the citizens of heaven. He's calling them to be ambassadors of Christ and to bring peace. He's reminding them of everything that is essential to being a Christian and to hold on to that in the midst of their circumstances. And so this is a call for us as well to remember what we've learned in Sunday school, to remember the sermons that we have listened to, to remember our Bible study. But it's also a call to remember those who taught us these things. There's an adage in youth ministry that more is caught than taught. That the people you are discipling, they learn just as much about watching you and how you live out what you are teaching as much as they're listening to the teaching, if not more. I mean, think back to if you were fortunate enough to have somebody walk alongside you and disciple you. Do you remember the three points of the lesson they taught you? Maybe a few that were very instrumental. But chances are you remember their kindness. You remember their grace. You remember how they stood strong in hard circumstances. You remember all the things that they were teaching you through their actions. And so it's good for us to think about the saints who have gone before us, who have faithfully lived out this faith, and to draw on their examples as examples for ourselves. And if, you're, if you haven't had a person do that, if you haven't walked alongside someone and been able to see the gospel take on flesh in your life, then I encourage you to like get in some of our bridge groups. Find people in your bridge group to walk alongside. Keep eye on them. Watch and see how they're living out what we're talking about on Sunday. Or you can even read biographies of missionaries. There's so many great lessons of faith to be learned simply by reading these stories of their people and, and just how God showed up in their lives and how they lived so crazily. I remember one I had to read back in, in college. It was, I don't, I don't remember where they went. Uh, I don't remember when it was. But I remember this simple lesson. Their dog ran away. And their kids were very young. And... 
obviously, you know, the Christian thing was to do is to tell your kids, well, just pray for God, you know, that he'll bring your dog back. And the missionary, he, he was just torn up inside because he's just thinking, man, God does not care about your dog, right? But, but he, he, you can't tell your kids that, and so he's like, yep, just keep praying, just keep praying. And I forget how long it was, but after like months or even years, this dog returned. And the missionary was just overwhelmed and just realized that just how much God loved him. Because he cared about this insignificant little dog. And he just thinks about just you know, the, the joy that his kids had in seeing God answer this prayer. And so he just, I think that's just a testament to who he was, right? He knew to go into prayer. He knew to pray when times were tough. And so that's just another thing I encourage you guys, or even uh, some of the famous theologians or preachers of the time. You know, D.L. Moody has lots of awesome things that you can learn about in his life. Spurgeon, you know, Calvin, all these guys, you know, who have waxed eloquent and wrote in books like this thick on theology. To study their life is truly enriching to see their example of how they lived out this theology. I remember D.L. Moody, when he first came to Christ, he didn't know a thing about being a Christian. But he knew he needed Christ, and so he simply just said, hey, you need Christ, I need Christ, there's a guy preaching, let's go hear him. He just knew that people needed Christ. He didn't understand all the theology behind it, he just knew it. And so he just constantly bringing people, hey man, come to church with me, hey, come listen to this preacher. And that eventually led him to opening several Bible colleges because he just cared so much about Bible knowledge and educating people in the Bible. And lastly, I, I think it's worth looking at Paul here as an example, right? Paul is facing all of He's shipwrecked, imprisoned, beaten, bitten by snakes, all of this just horrible stuff. And yet in the midst of all of it, he can continue to rejoice. He can continue to have peace. He can continue to be content. And we're going to talk more about that next week, so please come back and uh, tune into that. So in closing, hopefully you've noticed a pattern of all the things that we've been talking about today. That God's ways are not of the world, that they stand in complete contrast to it. And if we want peace in our lives, and if we want to spread peace everywhere, if we want to sp spread God's shalom, then we must do it God's way. The world says to find peace through winning, to find happiness by getting it your way. But the kingdom of God says that the true way to have peace is through joy, through grace, through prayer, and focusing on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you are a believer, then you already have the Spirit to help you do this. And so I encourage you to seek His way. Surrender your will to His. Pursue peace. Promote God's peace wherever you are. But if you're not a believer and you want to have peace in your life, then you must first have peace with God. To have peace with God, you must acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you have committed wrong against a holy God, and you are separated from him. And that you need to surrender your life to him and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Because only he can. Repent, which just simply means turning away from your sins. Stop chasing after evil and start walking towards Christ. And when you do this, you will start to feel the peace of God wash over you. And as you continue to follow him, he will give you the strength and the peace to do what we've talked about today. But don't go it alone. None of us should be going this Christian life alone. And so if you're making a choice here today to follow Christ, to surrender him and have him forgive you of your sins, then I ask you to, to tell one of the elders in the church, tell one of your friends that you came with today. 
You can write it on the bridge card. Put it in the offering bag when it comes around because we're here to help you to grow as a Christian, to become a disciple of Christ so that you too can promote and pursue God's peace. Let's pray. Father God, we, we just have to thank you and stand in awe of this wonderful salvation we have in you. Father, I just thank you for the joy of being called your son. I thank you for the joy of being forgiven all of my sins. I thank you for the joy that comes from having you as a father. Father, I just pray as, as disciples of Christ that we would just be able to, to just grow as people of peace. That we'd be able to put what we've learned today into practice to bring peace wherever we go. Father, may you just help us to be ambassadors of peace, to speak your peace to everybody we come in contact with. Father, we are helpless to do this on our own, and so that's why we bring this to you in prayer. Calm our hearts, calm our minds, Lord, and help us to just proclaim your peace to this world. In your glorious, magnificent, and mighty name, amen.